Good morning, everyone. My name is Amy Wren. I'm the Member Services Librarian at the Capital District Library Council. I'd like to welcome you to our fourth virtual member tour and the fifth tour in our series. Today, we'll be touring the New York State Military Museum. Their librarian and archivist, Jim Gandy, will be guiding us on the tour. During and after the tour, please submit any questions you have through the Q&A option on Zoom. After Jim finishes the tour, um, he'll answer qu any questions that you may have. I'll now hand it over to you, Jim. Okay, good morning. Uh, my name is Jim Gandy. You're actually looking at Mark Koziel, though. He's our chief curator. He's gonna give you a brief tour of the exhibits. So take it away, Mark. Okay, thank you, Jim. Yes, we're standing in the drill shed of the Armory building. This is where the National Guardsmen would uh, do their drills and other uh, duties. And so when uh, the museum moved in here back in the early 2000s, we converted the drill shed into the exhibit space. Um, so there's quite a lot to see. We cover all different time periods from the Revolutionary War right through the Cold War. Uh, we will be installing a GWAT exhibit in the near future. Um, so what I'm going to show you today is the Cold War exhibit that we installed in 2018. So our exhibit is called Hot Spots in the Cold War, concentrated on the events uh, during the Korean War and the Vietnam War, and the role of the United States in those in conflicts, as well as the role of uh, New Yorkers during the two wars. So. We do like to collect artifacts that have a strong tie to uh, people who have served in the National Guard or who are New Yorkers who served in the military. During the Korean War, the National Guard was called up all throughout the country. In New York, uh, 31 units were federalized. Only two of them served overseas in the war. That was the 101st uh, Signal Battalion and the 955th uh, Field Artillery. So I'm going to show you some really interesting objects that should come with me. This is the Korean War exhibit. Um, right over here we have some very interesting pen and ink and watercolor drawings done by Steve Jordan. He was a U.S. Marine both during the Second World War and during the Korean War. He served as a corpsman. Um, and so many years after his service, he put down onto paper and pen and ink what he saw during his service in Korea in 1950. So you can see some personal recollections of soldiers going through Incheon and, uh, I'm sorry, not soldiers, uh, U.S. Uh, Marines fighting in Incheon. And another really interesting drawing right here showing uh, wounded uh, U.S. Uh, Marine being uh, taken to an aid station. Um, because the war happened so soon after the Second World War, a lot of the weapons used in Korea were weapons that were used during the Second World War, such as the M1 uh, Garand rifle, which you can see through this case. Hopefully you can see it without too much glare. And uh, the M1911 pistol, which is a 45 automatic uh, pistol. So there's stories behind these objects. We know the owners. Uh, uh, who own the different objects, be it clothing or uh, weaponry and uh, so forth. So, in Korea, they had to battle the climate, very, very hot summers and very cold uh, winters. So, at the start of the war, the GIs didn't have all of the uh, winter equipment that they would want to have. So in 1950, uh, there were some men who were not well dressed and would have to wear something like this field jacket, which is water repellent, but not very warm during the winter. You can see this one in the corner. Uh, it's a model 1943 jacket. It was also uh, something that was in service during the Second World War and during uh, Korea. This is a winter uh, parka. There's a shell on the outside and a liner that's on the inside. What is interesting is he is wearing trigger mittens. Uh, so you can see the outer leather and uh, canvas on his uh, left hand. And on the right hand, we show you what is inside, which is a wool, a wool uh, like insert. 
that would go uh, first over the hand and then the outer covering would go over the wool. Uh, hopefully you can see the way that the wool was set up. Um, trigger mittens were very uh, useful during cold weather climates when they were fighting. If you wear leather gloves, they were awfully thin, so your fingers would get cold awfully fast. And regular mittens, as we know, you don't have the use of your fingers. So how do you shoot the rifle in January during the middle of the winter? So what they did is they had special mittens with a trigger finger as well as the thumb. And so that allowed the soldier to use the mittens while he was firing his rifle during the cold winters. So over here, we'll, we'll just step over here to this other section. Uh, uh, New Yorker William Chodel served as a naval aviator during the Second World War and Korea. And uh, at the early stages of the Vietnam War, he was a naval instructor at that point, uh, shortly before he retired. So he donated to us years ago uh, one of his naval flight suits his life preserver, helmet, and boots that he wore during uh, the, uh, uh, the Korean War. Um, Mr. Chodal was shot down during the war and uh, was in the water off the coast of South Korea for about four hours before he was uh, rescued by uh, the U.S. helicopters. Uh, we have his veterans interview online on our website, so that makes for some interesting uh, reading. And here's a couple more Steve Jordan drawings right here, showing everyday life, the GI having his uh, sea rations for dinner, and also trying to stay warm during the middle of the winter. And another one right here, uh, which is called, Oh Boy, Chicken and Rice for Dinner out of a can. So there's a little bit of humor in some of his drawings, um, which is kind of nice to see. So we'll go into the Vietnam Gallery. There's so much to see here that I can't show you everything today. But there's a couple of interesting weapons: a um, Springfield rifle on the left and a French rifle that's on the right. Um, just after the Korean War started in uh, June of 1950, about two months later, President Truman sent over 128 military advisors to Vietnam to help the French fight the Viet Cong or the communist forces that were battling the South Vietnam. So the U.S. gave weapons to the French and they gave them to the South Vietnamese Army to fight the North Vietnamese Army. Um, so that's how this 1903 Springfield rifle made in Springfield, Massachusetts wound up in South Vietnam. This was donated to us by a soldier who was stationed in Vietnam at the start of uh, the U.S. Part, uh, participation in the war in 1964-65. Uh, and he captured this off a body of a dead Viet Cong uh, woman. And so what would happen quite often is that the Viet Cong would um, salvage or take anything they would find on the field of battle, be it um, equipment, such as uh, helmets or weaponry, and they would reuse them. Um, so that's how a U.S. rifle wound up in the hands of a uh, North Vietnamese uh, D.C. woman. Uh, so what else can I show you? Also talk about, well, we put the wars into context of the Cold War and the fear of uh, nuclear war during that time period. So. Um, People were encouraged to build bomb shelters at home, and they were also told where to shelter in case of a siren going off, which would uh, signal a uh, nuclear attack by the Soviet Union. So in public shelters, the U.S. government had these sanitation kits. And inside the sanitation kit, you have all sorts of things. And Jim has shown you uh, some of the highlights that you would find in the can, such as toilet paper, uh, water uh, cans, uh, polyurethane gloves, and uh, survival ration crackers. Um, so something like this would be found in a lot of different public areas, such as in the basement of post offices, in the basements of City Hall. Um, so it's kind of interesting. 
uh, speaking of the Viet Cong, they would salvage whatever they could find in the field and use it, such as old tires that were discarded by either the French or by the U.S. forces. They would take the old tires and cut them down to turn them into sandals that the uh, Viet Cong would use during the war. Um, they would also salvage uh, U.S. gear, such as this uh, boonie hat, and that, that hat was also taken off um, the dead Viet Cong by a U.S. Marine. Uh, we have all sorts of weapons throughout the gallery, such as the M16 rifle, uh, which was put into use in 1966 and 1967. That's when it was uh, first introduced into battle. And an, another weapon that uh, would be remembered by a lot of veterans would be the M79 grenade launcher, which you can see in the foreground right here. It was a very useful weapon. It would shoot a round of this size and uh, it would come in all different sorts of variations from either buckshot or a solid shot. They could also shoot uh, flares out of it also to be able to signal uh, to uh, US forces. The only drawback to that weapon is you can only fire one dial at a time, unlike uh, the M16, which would have a clip of quite a few bullets. So over here, here's one of the more very interesting and sobering um, artifacts right here that Jim will show you. This is a U.S. Army uh, helmet. Uh, this is the M1 helmet. It was um, used by Dennis Finnegan. He was born in New York City and served three tours of duty in Vietnam from 1966 to 1972. He was in the 101st Airborne Division. During his three tours of duty, he was wounded three times. Um, this helmet was the one that he was using when uh, his truck convoy that he was a part of was ambushed by the Viet Cong. Uh, he wasn't killed uh, at this time, even though, as you can see, there was very uh, severe damage done by, uh, by uh, the enemy fire. Um, when he was going home, Dennis Finnegan sadly uh, died on the way home when uh, his uh, helicopter crashed after he was being attacked by the Viet Cong. This happened on October 31st, 1972. Uh, his brother donated this helmet to the museum. Uh, we show throughout the exhibits the, uh, like the evolution of uniforms. At the start of the war, the U.S. wore cotton clothing, which cotton is not the best thing to wear in Vietnam in a jungle uh, situation because it would absorb the moisture and not dry quickly. So within a few years, by the late 1960s, there were these uh, nylon cotton and hybrid coats and shirts that were introduced to the U.S. Army and that they wore those during the war. Um, so very much like in uh, Korea where the, uh, where the Army had to adapt to the climate, the same thing happened in Vietnam. Over here we have a very uh, popular section of the exhibit. We have the sea rations on the right hand side. Uh, you would get a uh, box meal kit that would contain all sorts of things. Like you can see here, there would be three cans of your main meal. It could be chicken and rice or beef stew or beans and franks, along with uh, cigarettes that the federal government gave to you and matches, uh, dehydrated coffee, uh, toilet paper, which is on the far right right here. Um, so the guys would often trade the cans of food amongst each other, trying to get the best uh, food for the day. Uh, the uh, fruit cocktail was the most prized item in the kit, and a lot of you guys have talked about how they would try to trade up and uh, get a can of fruit cocktail in exchange for something else that they didn't want to eat. And then there's personal gear, like you see over here, a uh, Zippo lighter in the middle, and a towel that quite a few GIs used during the war to try to uh, keep down the sweat. And then uh, there's a little tin of uh, foot powder on the right. And um, there's, sorry, I mean on the left. And then on the right, there is a uh, chain that would have been worn around 
the neck, that is a, a helicopter chain that was used in the, the operation of the motor of uh, the helicopter. Uh, sometimes those were taken um, as a memorial to someone that the GI lost in a copter crash and would be turned into jewelry that would be worn as a memorial to a lost comrade. Uh, are we good on time, Jim? I don't want to take too much time up. <laughs> yeah, you're doing great. Okay. Anything else that you want me to show them or we have time? Yeah, we have time. Okay, great. Sure. Okay. Um, getting back to how the artifacts are uh, personalized, this uh, U.S. Marine coat um, was owned by David Wallingford of, uh, of uh, Saratoga Springs. He was in the U.S. Marine Corps towards the late 1960s, served in Vietnam. He was wounded in a firefight and had to be um, sent to a naval uh, medical ship that was uh, stationed off the coast of uh, Japan. And while he was uh, recuperating from his uh, wounds, one of his uh, nurses uh, took care of him and they uh, developed a friendship and uh, David actually married the nurse, uh, Helene Wallingford. Um, so kind of interesting how during the, uh, the midst of war, Dave met his uh, future wife and they got married a couple of years later. And this is uh, her uh, dress blue uniform, uh, naval uniform right here. So those are some really interesting artifacts that we have. Um, this is one of the most common radios used by the US Army during the Vietnam War. That's a push to talk radio transmitter and receiver. Probably weighs about 30 pounds or so, maybe uh, 40 pounds. Um, so a GI would have to wear this as a backpack and carry it through the jungle uh, with his company. And we have on display here the short whip antenna, which they would uh, use when they were going through dense jungle. There's a much longer antenna that extends about seven feet high or so, but obviously that would not be something that you'd want to drag through the jungle with you. Um, so these are certainly recognizable artifacts that uh, the Vietnam veterans would uh, remember from their service. Uh, let's see, anything else I could show you down here. Down here towards the end of the exhibit, we have some examples of art uh, made after the uh, war and made after veterans who served in the Vietnam War. Um, these don't represent uh, therapy artwork, but in a way, I guess they do because it's a way for the uh, soldiers or uh, for the U.S. Marines to put down on canvas or paper some of the memories that they have. Uh, the one on the right here shows uh, Huey helicopters going through the jungle um, just above the canopy. And then on the left, this one shows um, some of the local Vietnamese uh, salvaging Coca-Cola bottles. Uh, this, uh, this drawing is called the Bottle Collectors 1969. And uh, as I said before, the uh, Vietnamese were very in industrious and would uh, recycle everything that they could find. So th that's about it. I hope you enjoyed this quick tour and enjoy the rest of which you'll see today. Thank you, Mark. Okay, you're welcome. Thanks, John. I'm going to be walking us down to the flag storage room, which is kind of exciting because I have never been in there because our flag curator. Um, It's a very tightly controlled climate, so you just can't walk in and out. And I don't have the security code to it either, so there's that. Uh, um, where we were just at is the um, area where they were going to school just up the street. And uh, when we opened in 2002, the gym teacher gave me grief because we were taking away one of the few indoor basketball courts. Um, here we go. 
This is Chris Morton. He's our fly curator. Um, he, he's been working for the agency since the last century. Since the last century, yes. Here we go. Okay, here we go. This is exciting. Just a little room here, about a thousand square feet, dedicated flags. There are various sub. The spade would have it. We got one laying out. This is a regiment of color from the Civil War. It's uh, going out on loan to be shipped out to another museum for display. So we're just getting it ready. It's silk, it's painted, it's from the latter part of the Civil War, and you can see it's got a nice little uh, New York State coat of arms painted right in the center, with the two women, Justice and Liberty, and a nice inscription just below. It's got some losses to it, this is what happens with flags, especially on the back end here to fly in. So not in terrible shape, I've seen worse, but uh, it does have some losses and it's quite and you can see here this is how we have them stored it's pretty neat it's a it's like a baker's rack baker's tray the flags sit nice and flat after they've been conserved and you can just very easily pull one out and there's a little silk flag Upside down a little bit there, but it's from the 77th New York State Volunteers, the regiment that was from the Saratoga Springs area. And this is made by Tiffany and Company, the little blue box people you may be familiar with. Any questions so far? I love it. No questions. <laughs> so, how many flags are down at the Capitol? Right now, there's about uh, 650. Okay. The flag collection in total is about 2,200 flags, about 1,000 from the Civil War. So we've conserved since 2000, we've conserved 500 flags. So this room here has about 250 of the conserved flags, all of them laying flat, like you see here. And at People's Island, the Office of Parks and Recreation historic preservations offices uh, in Waterford they have a thousand square feet of storage for us there with another 250 conserved flags there so we're chipping away well wow. awesome thank you All right. uh, do you want to do the arms vault yeah we can okay. look down the hallway let's watch this up there mm -hmm. Down the hallway we go. Got nice large columns to support the uh, exhibit space. Nice caissons and uh, artillery carriages. ZP4 from the 1950s. That's Soviet, right? What was that? That's Soviet, right? Yes. It's so designed as an anti-aircraft gun. You can turn that crank right there. Elevate the muscles. Got a convenient little tractor seat right there. It has a nice sandy wind whip look to it. Long story short, this was made by the Soviets in the 1950s when they invaded Afghanistan in the 1980s. They had this equipment. This was captured by the Afghanis. Fast forward to the early 1990s with the Desert Storm. We were fighting over there. This was used against us. The Marines were on the ground. They captured this. New York Air National Guardsmen out of Syracuse provided air cover for the Marines on the ground. So the Marines gave this to the New York Air National Guard as a nice little gift. So it's pretty neat. Got 
got some guns right here, artillery pieces. The bottom ones here, they're from uh, the Revolutionary War, British made. The other weapons are all American made of Civil, Civil War vintage. The two that you see there with the reinforced breeches are called Parrot Rifles. They were made down at the West Point Foundry near the West Point Military Academy. No affiliation to the Academy, it was just a convenient name. And then you got a three inch ordnance rifles, a couple howitzers. You can see this one right here with a nice patina onto it. That greenish look to it, that's what happens when a weapon, uh, an alloy is exposed to all the uh, elements in the air, including rain and, and uh, the atmospheric conditions. So it gets a nice patina onto it. It's like the Statue of Liberty. Statue of Liberty made out of copper. It, it shines so bright, you could probably were blinded when it was arrived in America and installed. But we all know it to have that green color to it. That's a patina due to the aging over time. Here's another area where we don't let Jim in too much. <laughs> Wait, what happened? <laughs> <laughs> another storage area. This is a, a former firing range here at this old, old armory that's been converted into our weapons storage, obviously. So it's completely lined with long arms in a small room over here. We got your handguns, swords, knives, cutlasses, and items like that. I'm showing you right now a couple Thompson submachine guns. Maybe you saw one upstairs in the exhibit. Here we have a couple recent donations. This is uh, from 1865, right after the Civil War, a special presentation grade sword that was given to a freshly minted second lieutenant by his subordinates. And you can see it's got beautiful little etchings but you can see that the American Eagle etched on there and then on the other side it has US and what's interesting about this it's got beautiful this is all brass it's got a nice little gemstone in the center of the handle it's got a little eagle head sticking out very nice and of course this is what they call scabbard sword fits into the scabbard it also has the same kind of decorative brass elements to it and what's interesting if you're going to go the whole distance and buy your new officer a sword you better get yourself a little presentation plate on there so he knows who we got it from Is it behind jim you got a couple more New items. This is another Civil War cavalry saber with its scabbard. You can see the curve to it. Cavalry mounted. They had curved blades, easier for slash infantry. They had a more straight blade for stabbing purposes. This one is a, a German piece from the World War II era. It's not a military sword, but it was a sword used by the police. Here's a nice little presentation sword with a nice ivory fluted handle and a little helmet head pommel. Knight's head pommel. And this little short weapon here is a uh, Model 38 Carcano rifle. Carcano is a, an Italian rifle. They made a variety of different models. This one is a model 1938 short rifle. And uh, perhaps you're familiar with Carcano. Like I said, they made several different weapons. Uh, the assassin of JFK. What was his name, Jim? Oswald. Oswald, he used the Carcano. Not this particular style, but a longer rifle, but still a Carcano, bolt action. We've got a wide variety. Here comes down here. You can pan out and take a look. 
uh, heavy storage racks, several weapons intermixed there, mostly machine guns. The tan colored one in the rear, that's a recoilless rifle that was captured from uh, the enemy soldiers in Iraq by the 108th Infantry, New York National Guard. Over here we have machine guns. These are our World War II vintage. This is a Lewis gun, which was a British design with a distinctive little circular pan magazine. These, this one here is a German weapon, another German weapon. Here's another Lewis gun like that one with a larger pan. And this one was meant for aircraft. And here, You have what's called an MGOA German machine gun World War One vintage with the water cool barrel. It's beautiful. It's got a couple of nice convenient handles for the gunner. And look, it's even got little knee pads. This was a nice luxury model. Three or four guys carried this around a gunner and a guy beat him with the ammo. But it proved to be too impractical. Didn't need to waste four guys moving this gun around. So the Germans made a little adjustment and they came up with this weapon. Same exact weapon, but they added this little rifle stock to it. So you could fire it. Gone are the knee pads. Gone is the luxury of just lounging around as you fire your machine gun. You now have to use it with the rifle stock to it. So it's adaptation. The Germans adapted their the weaponry to the tongs. Pretty neat stuff. Got more weapons over here. Got more War One. Both action of these three kids down below. Hard beat, civil war. It's got the leather covering for the barrel so that if you're at sea, the salt water doesn't cause any rusting or you have problems with the firing mechanism. And if you can get in here, this is, we'll conclude with one of our most musket. And you can see it got shot, bam, damaged by the enemy bullet. So we suspect that the soldier was carrying it with, his, with the butt in his hand, and it probably hit him right here, another 12 inches to the left. Could have been a little more hairy, a little more dangerous. Got some gun racks here for Springfield rifles. They simply stick in and you can rotate this down and lock them right in. So it's pretty cool. Lots of interesting weapons. Got to see some flags. Got a downstairs behind the scenes tour. So I hope everyone enjoyed it. Well, thank you, Chris. Okay. Take care. One of the big ex expenses moving into this place was remediating the lead from the firing range. And that's actually something they're dealing with at the armory throughout the state now. Um, I finish up in the research center, which I, uh, I run. Uh, we divide our collections up into two uh, sections. The curators, they get all the three-dimensional objects. Uh, they do all the exhibits. This includes all the exhibits at the various armories throughout the state. Uh, there are quite a few still in existence, uh, still being used. Uh, there are several down in, in the city. There's, they're all over the place. Um, I'm in charge of two-dimensional objects, uh, letters, maps, uh, books, that sort of thing. Um, our two main sources of, of obtaining uh, artifacts are 
through donation and through um, removing old items from armories. Uh, for instance, this map, is it too glary? It might be too glary, let me open it up. Uh, uh, World War I, uh, State of the Forces in September 1918. This was removed from the Park Avenue Armory down in the city, uh, home of the 7th Regiment. Um, um, we just got this one in this donation in the mail. It's an appointment for uh, a a soldier to become a sergeant, uh, dated 1845. Uh, this was from a private donor. Oh, the frame, the frame, the frame. And this uh, illustrated company roster from the Civil War uh, was actually donated to us from the Oneida Historical uh, Society, although it's uh, the one in Utica. Um, that's pretty much it. We have um, about 5,000 books, 10,000 photographs, and countless other objects. Um, I'm going to see if I can, oh, don't do that. Do that. Nope. That, that. Oh, there we go. Okay, that's me. Um, that pretty much concludes the tour. Does Anybody have any questions? Well, Jim, I'll start off one for you. Um, you mentioned that, well, Chris had mentioned that you had uh, thousands of flags. Do you have any uh, that remain from the Revolutionary War? I believe we do, although... Uh, I've... I, I'm hesitant to answer because I'm, I, I don't do anything with the flags, so, uh, but I can certainly check on that for you. Thank you. Mm -hmm. um, does anyone else have any questions? We don't have any in the chat or in the question and answer yet. Yeah, just a reminder, if anyone does have any questions, you can put it in the Q&A box um, or type it in the chat. Oh, we have one. Uh, mention New York history collections and oral histories. Well, that's actually a request, not a, <laughs> not a question. Okay. Um, we have about two, just over 2,200 oral histories. We've uh, digitized and most of these, and they're pretty much all online through our website and through the... Um, uh, New York Heritage site, too. That's probably an easier way to find them through New York Heritage. Is it org, Kathy? Yes, <laughs> it is. Okay. Yeah, and you also have a lot of photographs on your New York Heritage collections, I believe. Yes, I, we've put all of our Civil War photographs uh, online uh, through the Heritage, New York Heritage. Uh, and this is Susan. I will also say that it's um, one of the most uh, used collections on New York Heritage. So I guess it's a lot of, you get a lot of genealogical inquiries. Is that, I'm guessing? In, yeah. In, in yeah. your library? Yes, most of our uh, inquiries are genealogical. You have, um, can any researcher come to visit your library? I. Pre-COVID, yes. Uh, now, no. Uh, I do ask that uh, people call before just because, like everyone knows, it, it takes time to dig stuff out. Well, here's an oddball question for you. Okay. Do you, 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 your collections primarily, well, and almost exclusively focus on New York State history 
Do you have any pre-New York State? Do you have anything from the colony of New York? Um, our collection was started uh, in 1863. Uh, so we have very little stuff prior to that. Um, what we do have is just, um, uh, we, we have a muster roll from, I think, the War of 1812. It's on display upstairs. And literally, it was a rolled up piece of paper that we flattened out and framed. And it just lists everybody's name and when they signed it. Any other questions? Does anyone have anything to ask Jim? I really enjoyed the tour, Jim, from you and your colleagues. Yes, thank you, Jim. Yeah. Uh, oh, sure. I, I, I drafted them, so. A few years ago, we had an actual physical tour of the museum in the library, and I'm hoping we can get there again someday. <laughs> it, it, it's definitely worth the visit. Oh yeah, the, the curators have done a, a fabulous job. Uh, it's amazing to think, well, like I said, when my kids played basketball, it was just an open space with lines on the floor. Now it's, it's beautiful up there. I hesitate to confess this, but I'm also one of the ones who played basketball on that floor <laughs> way long ago. Yeah. yeah. All right, well, I just want to thank everyone for attending and thank you, Jim, um, for hosting us. Of and, course. Uh, yeah. And I hope everyone has a great day. Okay, thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you Thanks, Jim. Jim.